I fell in love with Ruby about 15 years ago, and I liked it so much I wrote the pickaxe, and since then I've revved that pickaxe three other times. I love languages, and I keep looking for new ones. Hi, I'm Dave Thomas, and I'd love to show you a new language I've found which I'm equally excited about. Elixir. It's a functional language, and it runs on top of the Erlang virtual machine, which means it's also inherently concurrent and distributed. But the syntax is very straightforward. It's unlike any other functional language I've seen. It's fun to read and fun to write. Elixir's syntax draws heavily on Ruby, so we use, for example, def to define a function. Def module defines a module. It looks very similar to the code that you'd write every day. But that uh, similarity actually hides a lot of subtlety behind the scenes. As I said, it runs on the Erlang virtual machine, which means it generates Beam code, and it's compatible with all the existing Erlang libraries, including OTP. And that means it's concurrent, it's reliable, and it's fast. Elixir is still a young language, but even so, it comes with a whole bunch of really cool tools. Obviously, we get a compiler. Uh, we also get an interpreter, so I can write Elixir scripts that don't have to be compiled first. It comes with a wonderful tool called Mix, which is kind of like uh, dependency management plus project management plus application management all in one tool. It's a bit like uh, Rake that's pre-configured to handle uh, all of the Elixir stuff. And of course, you can extend it with your own tasks as well. It comes with a unit testing framework, XUnit. And rather cool, it also comes with a documentation testing framework. This means that you can write sample code in your uh, program documentation, and you can actually test to make sure that it runs. And finally, you can download a tool called XDoc, which is a bit like Javadoc or RDoc. It generates documentation from your source files. So what makes Elixir so special? Well, it's a functional language. And, like most functional languages, it supports pattern matching. Pattern matching lets you decide what code gets run based on the content and shape of a set of variables. That sounds very abstract, but we'll see some examples later on. But basically, with pattern matching, your programs become a lot simpler and a lot more expressive. You'll also find you have almost no conditional logic in the code itself. Elixir has all of the regular structuring techniques, so we have modules and functions inside those modules. We have records for structuring data, and we have protocols. Protocols are a really cool technique that allow you to extend built-in libraries without actually changing their code. You can basically inject behavior into them. Elixir has macros, and they're hygienic macros, which means that they're not going to clobber your local variables by mistake. And Elixir features full metaprogramming. It's a wonderful language, a very deep language, and fun to play with. So, enough slides. Let's look at some code. Here I am in my Mac regular shell. Um, when you download Elixir, you get a tool called IEX, the Interactive Shell, which is like a REPL in most other uh, interpreted languages. A bit more, though, I can type regular uh, Elixir expressions and it evaluates them, but I can actually also evaluate any other code. So, for example... I can start uh, evaluating A equals 1, and the result is 1. And you look at that and you think, huh, that's just an assignment statement. Well, how about this? 1 equals A. That's strange. But what happens if I maybe say 2 equals A? Now it fails, because the equal sign is not an assignment. The equal sign is a match operator. What it tries to do is it tries to make the left-hand side the same as the right-hand side. So in the first case, it makes that happen by assigning 1 to the value of A. In the second case, the left-hand side is already equal to the right-hand side. And in the third case, it can't match. Now, I could say A equals 1, and that's going to bind the value 1 to A. But I could also say A equals the list, 1, 2, 3, and that's going to bind the list to A. But I can take this a step further. Remember that the left-hand side is just a pattern, so I can type in the pattern a list ABC equals A. So Elixir is going to make that match by assigning the value 1 to B, 2 to C, and 3 to D. So I'm destructuring the list as I'm assigning it across the match. There's another form of pattern matching that we can do. 
we can specify the pattern, which is a list containing a head, a vertical bar, and a tail. And what this is going to do is when it matches a list, it's going to assign the first element of that list to head, and then the remaining elements will get bound to tail. So now if I have a look at the value in head, you'll see it's 1, the first element of A, and the tail is 2, 3, the remaining elements in A. We'll use this a lot when we start programming with lists in a minute. Now, one thing that's really important to know is that this pattern matching doesn't just apply to what looks like an assignment. It also applies every time I need to bind values to variables. So it applies, for example, when I'm making a function call and I'm passing parameters to it. It also applies when I'm uh, sending messages between processes and I need to match the incoming data to a particular pattern in my own code. One of the cool things about this pattern matching is that you can actually get rid of most of the conditional logic in your code and replace it with pattern matching. You'll find that Elixir programs have far fewer if statements in them than programs in conventional languages. So we call Elixir a functional programming language. Let's have a look at some functions. So you define a function using the fn keyword. It's followed by uh, whatever arguments you want, so in this case, a comma b, and then the body of the function. Let's just add a to b. This is going to create an anonymous function, and we're going to bind it to the variable func. So having got that, I can now call this function by saying func dot, then, then the actual values of the parameters. But it gets even cooler, because most functions you write are pretty simple. They look something like this. They take some parameters and they uh, do something with them. So Elixir gives us a shortcut. We can write an anonymous function by saying, here, I want to add the first parameter of a function to the second parameter. And it will construct effectively the same function that we created before. So just to prove that works, let's just change the parameters. And yeah, we get 7, the sum. This facility is phenomenally useful, particularly when you're doing transformations. All those functions like map, for example, that convert the elements of a list from one thing to another. You can now write them far more simply. Now let's write some bigger pieces of code. So to do that, I'm going to use my editor buffer. This happens to be Sublime, but most editors now support Elixir. I could, if I want, run the code actually directly from Sublime, but I've got a, a terminal window on the right-hand side there. It's a bit more convenient for this demo to be able to run it from there. So what we're going to do is write some code to calculate the Fibonacci series. I'm sorry, I know everybody does that. So what's the definition of the Fibonacci series? It goes, the Fibonacci value of 0 is 1, and the Fibonacci value of 1 is 1. But beyond that, we know that the Fibonacci value of some arbitrary number n equals the sum of the Fibonacci value of n minus uh, 2 plus the Fibonacci value of n minus 1. So this is a standard definition of Fibonacci. You'll find it in any math textbook. But let's turn this from a, a specification into running Elixir code. So to do that, we're going to start off by defining a module. We'll call it play. And modules take a block, so it goes from do until end. There we go. And now we have to turn our little spec into Elixir functions. An Elixir function is defined with the keyword def. So we're going to put a def in front of our fib0. And then the body of the function is going to be do colon followed by an expression, in this case, 1. So the Fibonacci value of 1 is do colon 1 again. And last but not least, the Fibonacci value of some arbitrary number is going to be the same, the sum of fib n minus 2 and n minus 1. So we've taken a specification and we've converted it with really minimal effort into code. And that is phenomenal. But you may be thinking, okay, yeah, this is yet another mathematical example for functional programming. But the reality is you can do exactly the same thing when you are writing uh, any application. You can define your application in terms of simple specs like this and then very trivially convert it into runnable code. Ultimately, all of programming is about transforming data, taking some values and transforming them into different values. And that's exactly what functions do. So by combining functions, we can combine those transformations to solve the problems we need to solve.
we'll save that file away and go over to our shell and we'll run IEX, but this time we're going to give it the name of that file. And because I have no imagination, I call it t.ex. So now we've started IEX up, but our program, uh, our play module, has been loaded into it. So now we can just call it. Play.fib0, for example, is a, a nice easy one to start with, and it returns 1, as we expect. Play.fib1 returns 1, 2 returns 2, and 10 returns 89. With no fuss, we now have an executable specification. That's pretty wonderful. But there's a problem with this code. What happens if we feed it a negative number? Well, if we call fib minus 2, for example, then it's going to go into the third clause here, and that's going to end up subtracting 2 and calling fib again. So it's going to go minus 4, minus 6. It's always going to go negative, and it'll never stop. So what we need to do is to find a way of saying, hey, we're only valid for positive numbers. And to do that, we're going to insert something that Elixir calls a guard clause. The guard clause is the keyword that when, followed by one or more expressions. In this case, I'm going to say this function is uh, only valid if n is greater than or equal to 2. This is a form of, of pattern matching on the parameters, but it looks at the actual values of those parameters. So now, back in the console, we have to reload our play module. Uh, we get uh, a warning out saying that we're, we're redefining play. We know that. And then we get the bytecode listed for the module. No idea why it does that. But now we can actually play with our, our updated module. We'll make sure that uh, fib10 still works, and it does. Let's give it fib minus 10. Oh, we get an error. So let's uh, expand that out so we can actually read what it says. All right, it says, no function clause matching play.fib minus 10. So what this means is that Elixir cannot actually find a function to run for fib with a parameter minus 10. It's not that the function itself is testing to say, you know, I'm not only going to take a, a positive number. It's actually the code, uh, the compiler, and the runtime system that is uh, handling that force. And that's one of the reasons we get such great reliability out of Elixir code. We have support in the runtime system for all of the various constraints we want to put on our functions. So let's try another function here. Let's uh, try summing a list. So let's get rid of our Fibonacci code. Now, the sum of a list, how do we specify that? Well, the sum of an empty list is going to be zero. That's a convention that we'll use. So the sum of the empty list is zero. Now we have to work out the sum of a list that has elements in it. Now remember when we looked at pattern matching, we looked at the idea of splitting the list into the head and the tail. So now we can say that the sum of a list that has a head of head and a tail of tail is going to be the value of the head plus the sum of the tail. And that's it. That's a recursive definition. The recursive step there, sum it calls itself. Each time it calls itself, the list gets one shorter, so we know eventually it's going to terminate in the clause where it says the sum of the empty list is zero. So let's convert this into Elixir code. We saw how to do that before Fibonacci. We're going to say def sum, and then we're going to use do again for the zero. And now def sum of a non-empty list. And again, it's going to be do the head plus the tail. Save that file away. And then go back over into our shell. Now we have to reload that module. So we do our play, and we get our wonderful bit of tracing out again. Now we can try actually calling some. We'll pass it, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we get 15 out. Pretty wonderful. Let's do just one more function. We're going to implement map. You know map. It's the thing that takes a collection and a function, and it returns a list where the values are what happens when you apply the function to each element of the original collection in turn. So you could use it, for example, to double all the elements in a list. So what does map look like? Well, it takes a collection and a function. Let's think of the, uh, the limit case. If we pass it an empty collection, then map is going to do nothing. It's going to return an empty list. So that's that case. Now we have to think of the recursive step. 
And the recursive step is, again, we're going to split using head and tail. So the map of a list that has a head and a tail, oh, well, let's get the spacing the same as we used above just for consistency. So head and tail is going to be, now I'm going to show you a different way of defining a function body here. Uh, previously, we've used do colon, but you can also use do end, and that's basically a block form. Uh, the two are absolutely identical underneath the covers. In fact, the do end form just maps into do colon. Anyway, the map of a head and tail is going to be a result of calling the function on the head and then appending the tail of the list that we have to run through map. So that's going to run all the map on that. Except we might have to make sure we're returning a list, so I'm going to put that clause into square brackets to say this is a list that I'm returning. So back over in the console, we have to reload our, reload our code again. Oh, and we got some compilation errors. Okay, let's go see uh, what's gone wrong. First of all, we have uh, two warnings that uh, we have two unused variables. Uh, on line six, the variable func is unused. And on variable seven, the variable head. So let's go back and look at six. Well, yeah, func is unused in that clause because I have an empty list. I'm not going to actually apply func to anything. So to tell Elixir that I'm not using that, I put an underscore in front of the name. And that says it doesn't matter if this parameter is unused. I could have just used a naked underscore, but I personally prefer putting the name there. It's kind of like documenting what that parameter should be. So our next warning is that the variable head is unused on line seven. So there's head in our parameter list, but oh, there's a typo. I should have said func.head when I called it down the bottom there. So that should fix that one. The last one is actually an error, and it says that function func is undefined. So that's strange, because I've got my func there, and it seems to be okay, but I forgot to put it in the parameter list to map. So the last parameter of map is always going to be the function that we're going to apply. So let's add that back in. So now we should have fixed all of our compilation problems. But it's nice to know that Elixir is doing that kind of checking behind the scenes. So let's come back over and we're going to reload our module one more time. And this time we get our wonderful uh, bit of uh, bytecode out, but we don't get any errors. So let's see what happens now when we call our map function. We'll do play.map and we'll give it, oh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five again. Let's give ourselves a bit more room just to be able to type this. And we'll pass it as a function, uh, an anonymous function, which defines, uh, takes a parameter x, which is each element in the list, and it'll return the value x times x. We're going to square each value. And there it goes. Wonderful. Now, remember I showed you that shortcut syntax for doing uh, functions. We can actually write this function as ampersand 1 times ampersand 1, and it generates exactly the same code, which is great. But wait, there's actually more we can do still. Because remember I said that functional programming is all about transformations. In this case, we're transforming that list into another list. And we can write that explicitly in Elixir using a slightly different notation. So here's our map function. And we're going to take our original list and put it to the left of the function and then use the Elixir pipe operator. So the pipe operator basically says transform through some function. So it takes the value that's on the left and effectively passes it as the first parameter to the function that's on the right. So it's the same as writing the code we wrote previously. It just makes the transformation explicit. So we're going to map our list through a function that squares each element. That's really explicit. Now we have this transformation, we can actually take it a bit further. Let's transform it again, and this time we'll run the result through our sum function. And it sums it. Now you start to see the power of this transformation system. It's not just used for small code like this. I use it in big applications as well. Because when I start to write an application, typically I'll write down a list of the various transformations that I want to take place. I'm taking some command line parameters. I'm going to uh, parse those into some internal structure. I'm going to use that structure to make a database query. I'm going to use uh, some function to take the result of that query and calculate some totals. And then I'm going to use another function that's going to actually generate a report. And then I write down a list of all of those different transformations 
as the names of functions, and I put those pipe characters in front of them. And suddenly I have a working Elixir program. And then for each of those functions, I then have to break it down, and quite often I'll end up using that transformation inside that as well, and recursively handle it. So transformations are the key to functional programming, and the Elixir pipe notation makes it explicit. It's wonderful. So Elixir runs on top of the Erlang virtual machine. And because of that, it gets to use all of the fantastic features that gives us for concurrency and distributed programming. It means we can do things like run hundreds of thousands of processes on a single machine, and that machine just won't break a sweat. It's a wonderfully different way of thinking about programming. Now, it's a big topic. I don't have time to cover much of it here, but I want to give you a taste of the kind of things you can do with concurrency in Elixir. Here we are with a fresh editor buffer and a nice clean terminal window. So I'm going to show you some of the primitives in Elixir that let you do concurrent processing. So we're going to start up IEX. The first primitive I want to show you is uh, something called spawn. Spawn is what you'd use to create a new process. There are many forms of spawn. The one I'm going to show you here takes a function. So I'm going to say spawn, and I give it an anonymous function. So I use that fn keyword I showed you before. In this case, it doesn't have any arguments, and all it does is output hello. So what happens is we've immediately run that process, and you'll see that it does actually output uh, the hello. And then on the next line, you'll see the result of the spawn. Spawn returns the process ID, or the PID, of the background process. Now in that case, uh, this process is long gone. It did its work, it output hello, and it's terminated. Now there's another form of spawn, which is more useful to show the, uh, the deeper aspects of it, and that is when we spawn a named function. So to do that, we're going to create a module. Uh, we'll call it uh, S, because we're lazy. And we'll create a function in it. Uh, what should we call it? Let's call it, say, greet. And it'll be the same body as our anonymous function. It's just going to say uh, hello. It's going to do iope.putS hello. Save that away. Now we need to uh, load that file in. And this time we have to compile it. So we're going to compile the file spawn.ex, which is uh, where I created that. So it tells us that it now created a module called s, which is good. I can call that greet method directly and just check it works. So yep, s.greet outputs hello. Now I can spawn it as a background job. And to do that, I'm going to use a slightly different version of spawn. I'm going to say spawn. I'm going to give it the module name, the name of the function, and then any arguments I want to pass to the function. And you see again, it ran. This time, it actually output the PID first. Now, the two things are running in parallel, so it's basically a crapshoot which one comes out first. But you see it successfully ran our function. So how would I go about passing a message to my function? Well, over in the greet uh, function, I'm going to have to use a Elixir receive block. And that says I want to receive a message at this point. And receive takes a block, so do and then end at the end here. And then I have to tell it what that message looks like. In this case, I'm going to say, if I receive the message greetings, that's just an atom, um, then what I want to do is to say io.put as hello. So I receive greetings, I output that message. So back in my shell, I'm going to recompile uh, or reload my uh, S module. And now I'm going to try that spawn again. But this time, I'm going to need to remember the PID, because I'm going to use that PID to send a message. So I'm going to spawn my function. Notice this time it does not output hello. So if I want to make it output hello, I have to send it greetings. So I'm going to use the arrow operator there, which says send a message to that PID, and the message I'm sending is the atom greetings. And now I do that, and it says hello. Excellent. Let's try doing it again. Now this time it doesn't say hello. Why not? Well, because our function has done its business, right? It received the message, it output hello, and it exited. And once it's finished, the process is terminated. So there's nothing there to receive the next message. So I need to make this function receive a message. And to do that, I need to make it loop. But the bad news is, there is no loop in Elixir. Actually, that's the good news, because there's better ways of doing it. In Elixir, I'll do a loop by actually just calling the method again. So I'm going to call greet at the end of greet. It's a recursive call. You may be thinking, well, that's going to use an incredible amount of stack space, but it doesn't. 
because Elixir does tail call optimization and converts that greet into effectively a jump back to the beginning of the function. No stack is harmed in the execution of this function. Let's go back over to our shell here. We're going to reload our module. Uh, we're going to spawn it again. And now we'll be able to send the greeting message to our PID. And it comes out correctly. And we can send it as many times as we want. Now what happens if we send it something absolutely random, something it's not expecting? Nothing. It doesn't receive the message, so it's not going to output anything, output anything back. So let's change it so that we can actually uh, receive an arbitrary message. And we'll do that using pattern matching. Remember that we're actually matching the message against the pattern. In this case, the underscore says match anything. And when we receive anything, we're going to output what? Back over here, we're going to reload our, our module. We're going to respawn it. So now if we send it the regular message, greetings, it comes back with hello. But if we send it something arbitrary, then it says what? Now, you may have heard talk of Erlang and Elixir being able to reload code on the fly. You can basically load code into a running application. And that's done because the Erlang VM supports a sort of minor level of versioning of modules. If you have a module that's running and you reload that module's code, then any code that's using the existing module will carry on using that until it explicitly mentions the module's name. If we have a look at our greet function, for example, you'll see that at the end of the loop here, we just call greet. We don't put a module name there, so it's going to loop back up. If there was a new version of the greet module of the S module lying around, it wouldn't use it because we're not explicitly causing the module name. But if we put s.greet in front of it, then it would cause a reload if there's new code there. And that's pretty cool. It means that we have control of exactly when we want to use the new code. So let's see how you'd use that in a typical message loop. We're going to add a new message that says reload our code. And to do that, I'm going to restructure this just slightly. So now I have explicit handling of our greetings message. It outputs hello and then calls greet. Now we're going to have a new message, which is going to be reload. And when we receive a, a reload, we'll output a cheery little message to say, yep, we're about to do the reload. And then we're going to loop back to call greet, but explicitly pass in the module name. So we're going to say s.greet and not just greet. So now we have the recursive step at the end of each of those uh, receive loops. We don't need it down the bottom anymore. So we're going to go back over here into our console. And we're going to recompile and reload this module. We're going to have to start it manually the first time just to get this new code running. So we're going to spawn that new code. I'm going to check to make sure it actually works. So we'll send our PID the message greetings. And sure enough, it says hello. So now we can go back over here and we can change our code. So we'll change it to say hello world, for example. Save that away. Come back over here. Now we haven't actually compiled it yet, so there's no new code running. So it's still going to carry on doing the same thing. Let's now compile the new version of our S module. And when we do this, the Erlang VM will have both the old and new versions running. If we pass our uh, process, the greetings message, though, it's still using the old one because it hasn't reloaded. But if we now pass it a reload message, now it's going to uh, explicitly mention the S module and reload it. So now if we run our greetings, we get the updated version of Hello World. The joy of this is that we're synchronizing the process so that we don't have to worry about when that code gets uploaded, isn't updated. It's never going to get updated in the middle of doing something. It gets to control when it does get updated. So for simple programs, this is great. We've written our loops, we've been able to reload code, and we control the whole thing ourselves. But once your programs start to grow, you're going to want to structure this a bit. And one of the great things is that because Elixir is compatible with all of the existing Erlang libraries, that means it's compatible with OTP, which is the Erlang framework for handling large uh, applications. 
And OTP actually handles all the kind of housekeeping details of this kind of thing for us. So, for example, we no longer have to write these loops that receive messages. Instead, we just write a module, say that this is a particular OTP kind of behavior, and then OTP will just call into that module to say, here, handle this message, handle that message. Similarly, it will handle the versioning of your software. You can give it specifications of all of the modules in your system and how they interact. And then when you update a module, it will go through and intelligently update all the actual running code. It will also cope with the fact that as you update code, your representation of data may have changed from one version to the next. And it gives your code the opportunity to migrate that data as well. That's a brief introduction to some of the uh, concurrency uh, stuff that we get with Elixir. Let's have a look at just one more thing. Let's have a look at our um, testing framework. As I said, Elixir comes with a framework called XUnit or EXUnit. Um, if you're familiar with any of the other uh, unit testing frameworks, this will look very familiar too. Uh, we define a module that does a, a tests for a particular thing. In this case, it's for CLI. The next line, use exunit.case, uh, brings in the behavior that we need. In this case, it brings in the functionality to do the testing. Um, and the testing that we're going to do is written using a DSL. So it gives you an example of the kind of uh, uh, metaprogramming that you can do with Elixir. So we say test, the name of the test, and then a block. Now, inside that block, we use very simple assertions. We just say assert something equals equals something else. In the frameworks you're using right now, you may be using assert equal, assert not nil, those kind of assertions. Well, Elixir, we don't have to do that because the metaprogramming lets us get the information that we want immediately. That last test in there, the test that says that we should return a default value of 5 if we pass in just the user and the project, is actually wrong. The default value that comes back is 4. So if you run that with exunit, look at the message you get. You run the mix uh, tool and say, I want to test my code, and it runs through. You get a failure, uh, the failure message you expect. But now, because uh, Elixir lets us do things like intercept that equals equals clause, then we can actually report on exactly what went wrong and why. So we're actually going to say that we expected user project 4 to be user project 5. That's really very, very cool. It's also interesting because the override of that equals equals method is purely localized to that test block. Uh, Elixir has the ability to change behaviors of things scoped lexically. And that's really nice. It means you don't have this risk of I've made a change to some fundamental thing and it breaks some other library over in different code. Just to recap. When you're using Elixir, you have full compatibility with all of the existing Erlang libraries. And that includes OTP, which means you can write these large distributed reliable systems that Erlang lets you write. You also get cool tools. You get Mix, the build tool. You get a test framework. You have a documentation system. And you also get the ability to write comments that contain code fragments and have those code fragments tested uh, using a tool called DocTest. And uh, if you're interested in web frameworks, there is a very cool but still very young framework called Dynamo coming along. Uh, it's still in alpha, but already it's, it's functional. It's a very interesting approach to uh, writing web applications. But the real thing about Elixir that I want to get across is that Elixir is fun. It has that certain quality. I have no idea what it is, but Elixir is a joy to use. And that's why, if you have the time, I would recommend you spend some of it just having a look at Elixir. It has a bit of a learning curve, but it's not as steep as, say, Erlang. And once you master it, you'll find yourself thinking about programming in a totally different way. So, just because I have to shill, if you want more information on Elixir, you want to go to elixirlang.org. And if you want uh, information on the book that I've written about Elixir, then you're going to go to pragprog.com slash titles slash elixir. Feel free to contact me on at pragdave or hash pragdave or dave at pragprog.com. And like I say, try elixir and just see if it does what you want. I think you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much for listening. <music>